I don't know if any of you are familiar with the books or the movies, The Shape of Things to Come, H.G. Wells. How many of you are familiar with that? The science fiction stories and so forth. And the thing is, is that it really wasn't science fiction. In truth, it's actually fact in terms of trying to think ahead and future cast. That's all that it really was. So when you look at the shape of things to come, we have received that as science fiction. Just as, tell me something else that H.G. Wells might have written at one time. Anybody else know? War of the Worlds. You can place it right back here, Janica, thank you. So War of the Worlds would be another one because of something that he's thinking forward to that might happen, that we are not alone in the universe and so forth. But more in the shape of things to come, you need to take the title literally. And also remember that H.G. Wells was part of a society for a while that was planning out and trying to plan the shape of things to come. Well, this is what we saw in the book, The Shape of Things to Come. Now, you wouldn't necessarily see this in the movie because it just doesn't play well. So instead, you see all, thing, all sorts of things about robots and other things, and, and maybe they skip over major, some of the major elements. First of all, an eventual global government that is ruled by air by an intelligent, benevolent dictatorship. Nations are eliminated, and they are made to be more as nation states. And they are all at the bequest of the global entity, which is ruling over them. So they are states. They have some states' rights, if you will. They have some ways that you can consider democracy in terms of, well, who's living there? Well, let's vote if we want to paint something pink or purple. If we want to uh, be able to have our zoning laws this way, let's go ahead and have a vote. Now, that is what they would call a democracy. But in terms of the big decisions, no, we need to let the intelligentsia do that for you because you're ruffians. You're not people that really understand the causes and the ways, ways that things actually work. The elimination of major world religions. Within the shape of things to come, you would see that he looks at three major world religions. He looks at Judaism, Catholicism, and Islam. And all three of these major branches are eliminated, eventually with Catholicism retreating to, to Ireland and having a last bastion there before they have finally succumbed. Judaism and with, with the Jewish faith, with the folks that were following the Jewish faith, they eventually were watered down, blended into society, and eventually it became cultural and it just all disappeared. And in some ways, you can say that a lot of that is happening right now. Think about what's happening within our faith. Whether it be someone who is Jewish, someone who is Islam, is Muslim and is Islamic, or someone who is Protestant, Evangelical, or Catholic. We're starting to see a watering down, either by historical criticism, by liberal viewpoints. You take a look at what's happening within the Catholic Church right now. Things that are being spoken by Pope Francis are things that if you said 50 years ago, people would think, well, where did this guy come from? Obviously, he's a phony, right? And things that are happening within Islam now. And I know that most of us don't take a look at all of the different uh, facets of Islam, but within Islam itself, there's many, many different schools. But liberalism is making a huge stride right now. And I think what you're seeing in many ways through the development of ISIS, the continuation of that is because of the fact that they are fighting a last gasp right now to try to make themselves relevant. So you see this happening right now throughout the religious landscape. The book displays one of the earliest uses of the abbreviation CE, Common Era, instead of AD. So with this, you have a future cast explaining exactly what's going to be happening. It's almost as if we're taking a look through a time portal. And of course, as you know, what was H.G. Wells also uh, known for? He was about books and science fantasy about time machines, correct? So in this, I'm not saying that he had one, but he is with a society of people and with think tanks that are planning these things through gradual means. Now, what was H.G. Wells forecasting for the citizens of the earth? What was behind all of his 
philosophical presuppositions. Well, let's just go ahead and uh, look, let's, let's face it, back when people didn't have TV and radio, uh, especially the aristocracy, maybe they spoke a little bit differently. So you'll need to get past that, but let's let H.G. Wells speak for himself, himself in terms of what he believes the world should do to escape poverty. Mr. Wells, have you any uh, uh, solution for the very unhappy state of affairs that uh, is facing the world today? It seems to me that many things besides the pound are threatened with collapse. The financial credit system is not working today. We, are, we have increased the productivity of our, social, of our economic organization so greatly that a smaller and smaller proportion of people can produce everything that we need. The consequence is that a larger and larger number of people are being forced out of employment and are unable to consume. Well, remedies for national competition, disarmament, reduction of armed forces and lowering of tariffs. Secondly, for currency, a world conference and world action. And, as I've already said, for the third thing, overproduction, communal buying, public employment, public enterprise taking the place of private enterprise for profit. Was that pretty clear? So what is he advocating? This is H.G. Wells. And this was actually quite a common thought in the period, if you would take a look at, from the 1870s all the way through the 1930s and 40s and so forth of Great Britain. So what he is really focusing on is the shape of things to come describes the gradual move into globalism by way of communal socialism as envisioned by Wells and his contemporaries at the Fabian Society. Now, as soon as I say something about the Fabian Society, uh, I think a lot of people start to roll their eyes and go, oh, here we go, it's going to be a conspiracy theory thing. And, and it's, I'm sorry, but if, if you lived in London, you would know where the headquarters is. If, if you lived in England and you had any sense of history, and there's nothing wrong with looking back in history and looking at seeing how things developed, you would see really what the Fabian Society turned into and really what they tried to influence by some of the most powerful and well-known people that were in England at the time. And that later, not only were they tied in with the most powerful people in Great Britain, but also India, and then as well the United States. The Fabian Society. It's an odd name. Why do, you, why do you think that that would be? What would be something that would give you the idea of the Fabian Society? Well, first of all, let's take a look at their first crest. Their first crest, as many of you I think have seen before, is of a wolf in sheep's clothing. In other words, we will seem to be one way. We will seem to be erudite. We will seem to be caring about the masses caring about people and social justice because that's what's important. And that was at the very core of the Fabian Society was that the way that we're going to do this is through, through social justice because it's also the thing that helped in terms of what happened with Marxism. Now, the Fabian strategy, of course, is coming is a military strategy where pitched battles and frontal assaults are avoided in favor of wearing down an opponent through a war of attrition and indirection. While avoiding decisive battles, the side employing this strategy harasses its, its enemy through skirmishes to cause attrition, disrupt supply, and affect morale. 
Employment of the strategy implies that the side adopting the strategy believes time is on their side. But it may also be adopted when no feasible alternative strategy can be devised. So if you have an army coming at you that you cannot beat frontally, that there's no way head to head you're gonna beat them, this is the way that you do things. This is the strategy that you employ. And in many ways, you take a look at what's happening militarily right now with what ISIS is doing. This is exactly what they're doing. They cannot amass forces and take on the United States, you know, gun for gun. It's not gonna happen. So what do you do? Chaos and conflict everywhere, a war of attrition. So this is what was said um, for why the Fabian, decide, Fabian Society decided to take the name. For the right moment you must wait, as Fabius did, most patiently, when warring against Hannibal, through many censured, though many censured his delays. But when the time comes, when the time comes, you must strike hard, as Fabius did, or your waiting will be in vain and fruitless. In other words, there might be a long period of time, gradually, that you are introducing socialism, introducing some different concepts that, that are against the free market, are against capitalism, are against the Christian worldview. You're gonna to start to introduce these things slowly, slowly, slowly in a process that I'm aware of that's called dripping. So you drip, drip, drip. But the thing is, as many of you know, <laughs> of course, those of us that live in Florida and have many roof leaks and so forth through our hurricanes and that kind of thing, is that a drip that's slow and steady can fill a whole bucket pretty soon. So the Fabian Society, it's a socialist society founded in 1884 in London, having as its goal the establishment of a democratic socialist state, first in Great Britain and then globally. And there are Fabian societies throughout the world. The Fabians put their faith in evolutionary socialism rather than in revolution. And what we mean by that is that they would look and see what happened with Lenin and what happened in Russia. Uh, we don't want that. We don't want to have a bloody revolution, turn over the tables and so forth. What we're after in instead is to have the population willingly welcome in our ideas. And if we do this over time, they will say, bring it, that's what we want. As opposed to doing what happened in Russia, which as I'm sure many of you know, was orchestrated in great part by Germany to try to eliminate that front from fighting in World War I. I would also suggest, just as a side note, so many of us have studied World War II up and down and to death. You need to study World War I. It's what changed everything. It's what changed what would be known as well as purism, which the Fabian Society as well wanted to eliminate. And that would be, such as what you see happening in North Korea, where you have one father to son to son to son ascendancy. Uh, that's something that they definitely wanted to do away with because they wanted to have a collective intelligentsia. Okay, some famous Fabians, and these are ones that have died. Okay, H.G. Wells, N. Anne Besant, Sidney Webb. Now, let me tell you this. These are ones that have died. I, do you want me, I can name you a couple of really very popular names that are Fabians right now. How about Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London? Tony Blair. How does that get you? Okay, but you, I mean, I was at the Fabian Society three weeks ago. <laughs> that was right there, taking pictures. No problem, walked in, no, no problem at all. It's there, it's not a question of it not being there. Beatrice Webb, Hubert Bland, bunch of stories about Hubert Bland I'd love to tell, but we don't really have time. Frank Podmore, who Frank was really the one that helped shape a lot of things at the initiation of the Fabi Fabian Society, the founding of it. He was one of the ones that truly guided it. Uh, we could get into so many other names and personalities and uh, men that really tried to be the first ones to accept transgenderism and so forth 
in the late 1800s and try to introduce that as something that is normative, uh, this is where a lot of the concepts that we have today come from. And then as well, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, George Bernard Shaw. And a lot of you are thinking, <laughs> what does he have to do with globalism and so forth? I mean, I know George Bernard Shaw, my fair lady, right? I mean, on the street where I live and her face is still familiar. You're talking about, uh, I mean, one of the classic plays, one of the, the classic things of all time. It was first written, of course, as a play by, uh, by George Bernard Shaw as Pygmalion. And if you know any of your Greek literature, to think about what Pygmalion was. Well, let's hear a little bit from George Bernard Shaw. He was the playwright, philosopher first. And as we talk about George Soros, that's what I want you to remember. We're not talking about an economist. We're not talking about Darth Vader. We're talking about someone who was a philosopher first. Okay? And we need to at least respect what he brought to the table. But let's hear from George Bernard Shaw, who one of the most popular things to do, especially if you're one of the social elite, is to go and hear George Bernard Shaw because he was the most brilliant man alive. You know, the, the seat that Henry Kissinger had for many years, you know, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, this was the man that you wanted to hear because he had the knowledge of everything. Ah, it's no good in this country putting questions of national importance to me. I've been here before. I told you what to do and you haven't done it. <laughs> and you're up to your neck in trouble. In I told you in New York, I put it to you very carefully and exactly. I told you that what you had to do in this country was to abolish your constitution which was preventing you from doing anything. And now you see what's happened since. Every attempt you've made to do anything, the Supreme Court immediately stopped you and said it's against the Constitution. Well, I tell you again, get rid of your Constitution. But I suppose you won't do it. You have a good president, and you have a bad Constitution. And the bad Constitution gets the better of the good president all the time. At the end of it will be that you might as well have an English Prime Minister. So the very erudite, uh, extremely arrogant, and so forth, George Bernard Shaw, uh, here on this luxury cruise liner that sails into New York Harbor, then comes into New York Harbor and has people gathered in the press and so forth and sits back and just tells us to abolish our Constitution. That if we really want things to work, because of course they are the smart ones, they will follow, we will follow their lead. Because then everything will be better. Because you have a good president now. And who was president? FDR. FDR. If you just follow what he wants to do instead of that lousy Supreme Court thing getting in the way, if that could just be removed, then we're not going to have any problems. So if, if, you could, if you could just imagine that this is, in their mind, what is the best way to make things work, is to ensure that we have our way of government superseded by someone who is making decisions on our behalf. So it's better just to give it, so what are you basically doing at that point if you follow that advice? If you follow that advice, even though we had the American Revolution, that we broke from England because we wanted to have a common union, that we wanted self-governance, basically what you're doing is you're creating a monarchical episcopate again. Okay, so let's get down to the crux of things here with Mr. Shaw. In My Fair Lady, 
Henry Higgins finds a backstreet Cockney girl, Eliza Doolittle. She was a Doolittle, right? She does little, right? She's not worth anything. In Covent Garden, don't forget Covent Garden, and molds her into the model of a high society aristocrat. Do you remember the phonics and so forth that he would go through to try to make sure that her voice was at the right place and so forth? Shaw's title, as previously seen in the video before, was Pygmalion, in reference to the Greek legend of the sculptor who carved a woman out of ivory. According to Ovid, after seeing the, the perpetities, I'm sorry, he was not interested in women. But his statue was so beautiful and realistic that he fell in love with it in response to his prayers. The statue was brought to life. So what he did, you had a sculpture that had no interest in women, but he began to sculpt a woman. He then saw how beautiful she was and then fell in love with the statue. And he prayed that this statue would come to life and Aphrodite made the statue come to life for him. So it was out of his hands and it's what he molded. It's what he created. So the molding or shaping the world to our heart's desire is key to understanding current geopolitical trends. It all comes back to this, folks. And I'm sorry, I, I know some of us, My Fair Lady is one of our favorite movies. You'll never be able to watch it again. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, and it is wonderful, and Julie Andrews was great in the play, and Audrey Hepburn was just amazing, but I'm sorry. Okay, this is the Fabian window. So if you take a look over in the far left corner in the green, that is George Bernard Shaw. Okay, and he has his other contemporaries there with him. What are they hammering as blacksmiths, what are they doing? They are shaping and molding the world. And you see up at the top, it says, mold it nearer to the heart's desire, okay? Pray devoutly, hammer stoutly. So again, there's that essence of where we are going to hammer away at this. We are going to shape it in the way that we see in that same Pygmalion sense we are going to create the statue and bring it to life. Something completely different than what the entire history of the world, of civilizations, whether in the East or in the West, whether it was based upon an Eastern mindset, whether it was based upon a Christian mindset, whether it was based upon a Muslim mindset, we are going to now take this world and we're going to shape it to our desires, to what we think it should be because we are going to be the saviors of the world. See, the way things are, all we have to do is convince people that it's the opposite. Black is white, man is woman, woman is man. Right is wrong. New heresies. New heresies. Because you think about it, go back 25, 30 years when you had folks like the Christian Coalition and others. They were against, and they were the ones boycotting Disney, ESPN, the others, and so forth, and having them change what they were broadcasting, right? Because so many things that were said back then were heresies. Well, guess what? The other side was watching that. Going, yeah, that's a, that's a good way to do it. It gets a lot of press, too. Yeah, we don't want that. So you see all the Fabians at the bottom of the window. They are praying to the works of science and to the works of philosophy. That is their new God. See, we are created in the image of God, but they're gonna create God in their own image. And the image of God is themselves and their wisdom. Now, interestingly enough, there's a Fabian that broke away because he ended up not agreeing with all their ideas. And he's over on the far left corner as H.G. Wells thumbing his nose at the others. Do you know who designed this? George Bernard Shaw. And it was lost for a little while. It was found in Phoenix, I think in a Sotheby's auction or something, and then brought back to London and it was placed back in the London School of Economics 
which is another story that I'll get into here in just a bit. Okay, so where we get that whole idea of remold it near to the heart's desire is from a poem from an Iranian <coughs> poet. Ah, love, could you and I with him conspire to grasp this sorry scheme of things entire? Would not we shatter it to bits and then remold it nearer to the heart's desire? And if you're looking anywhere around the world, that's exactly what's happening. Our civilization is being shattered to bits, not necessarily in a militaristic sense, but everything that we stand for, everything that we hold true is being shattered to bits. That's what's happening. And sadly, some people that we have revered in the past are on board with it for this whole global idea. Now, we have to remember that those that are doing sometimes the worst evil in their own minds, they would never think that they're doing something evil. If you were to have a conversation with some of the greatest evildoers, they would say, no, we're doing good. We're doing things well. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing. I'm going to be helping things. The world will be better by what I'm doing. This is all for your sake and for the sake of civilization. So they might in their own strange way have a good intent, but they know better than you and you just need to follow and do what they're saying. See, that's what's implied here. So as our world is shattered to bits, so many of us go, well, but I, I should care about some of the things that, of course I don't want violence against African Americans. Of course I don't. No, I'm not racial. Oh, you're telling me I'm racial because of what? White privilege? Oh, well, I, how do I check that? I'm sorry, what? No, I mean, I love, no, but I'm married to a Chinese woman. I'm a half Cuban and I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm racist and I can't because I'm half white skin. Okay, and you're not. So all of these things are continuously going on. Now, as they shatter the world and piece it back together again, here are some early initiatives. Now this comes from the 19th, late 19th and early, early 20th century. These things were not around back then. Socialized healthcare. Okay, now when I say socialized healthcare, remember, that we have gone in Western civilization, in Christian society, we have gone to where the center of town, like when I lead people on tours all the way through Europe, what was at the center of town? The church. Now, even if it was in a Catholic sense, okay? And we can talk about all the issues there, but remember, like if I take people to Geneva, and okay, we're gonna do, we're gonna do a, a, some time in John Calvin's church in, in Geneva you got to walk all the way to the top of the highest hill, and everything else is then down from Saint-Pierre. It's at the very highest point. If you go to Wittenberg, you will see St. Mary's, the city church, and the Stadtkirch. And the Stadtkirch is the city church. Everything is around the faith itself. If you go to London, you have St. Paul's, you have Westminster. Okay? Everything revolved around the faith. But that's not the case anymore. We go from that being the center to the next generation when we start going to the folks that then we go into the post-enlightenment and enlightenment era. What then was the center of things in the enlightenment era? All of a sudden now it's the state house. It's the seat of government because that's where justice is done. So if we have a grievance, if there's a problem, then we need to make sure that we're going to where that can be taken care of. And now, thank you Fabians, the center of town, what everything is centered around, you gotta make sure you're close to, is the hospital. Because no longer is it about my spiritual health that was the most important thing in my life. No, no longer is it just about having justice being done and being governed properly and this being a communal thing that we as self-governed value. Now it's just take care of me. Make sure that my heart is still beating at the end. Minimum wage. 
Now, we can talk about what some of the benefits of that were to eliminate some of the terrible working conditions. But we also need to understand that we're not talking about slavery. Really, minimum wage, and in, in I think the, the greatest sense should be whatever you're willing to work to do something for. If you are willing to work for something and to get a certain wage, that's fine. Because in our society, in the way that our founders had, had done things, you have the choice. If you no longer want to do this, then you can do that with that person. If you aspire to do something else, if you've got a good idea, chase after that. We are the land of opportunity, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But that's not the way they looked at it. Minimum wage. And so what's one of the big things that we're fighting about right now? A $15 minimum wage. So if you go to Seattle, I used to go to this little restaurant there called 13 Coins. And it was reasonable, it was fantastic. Well, now their prices are in the 25s and 30s, and it's still like a diner. Why? $15 minimum wage. That's what's going on. Eugenics. Now, eugenics is not a product that's offered on an infomercial at 2 o'clock in the morning. Eugenics is one of the greatest evils ever let loose in the land. And it continues today state-sponsored through Planned Parenthood. But eugenics in its most evil form, uh, not only, and I would say the shedding of innocent blood is horrible, but it's a total plan of being able to control and in a positive sense, make sure that you have a pure race. Perceived social justice. If there's not a problem, if there's not a grievance, create one. If there's something that you want to make sure that you create an entire society of victims, that's what's happening. We have a problem in the United States where everybody now is a victim of something. And we must have our rights restored. I, think about this for a moment. We're talking about hurricanes and so forth. Oh, there were some huge hurricanes. And I don't mean to upend anybody else's presentation but huge hurricanes in the 1800s and 1900s. Talk about Galveston, what happened there. You know what happened the day after the Galveston hurricane? Citizens came in, gathered up the bodies, burned the bodies, put lie on some of those that they couldn't burn right away. They need to be identified. They began rebuilding their city. What happens when a hurricane happens now? You're not allowed even back into your city. The government will take care of it for you. So we've, we've completely changed in the way that we do things now. So with this, you have a perceived sense that I am a victim and I need the government to take care of it and I need a law passed for it. You know, I decided that I've self-identified as something. If, you know, I've decided I'm self-identifying as a woman and decided to walk into a restroom, that was actually becoming quite okay. And I know we're still fighting over it, but during the Obama administration, I mean, it was, we were on grease skids heading right towards that, all over the place. I remember I was, took a flight over to Washington, D.C. about a month and a half, two months ago to see the Ferris. And I made the, the plane reservations the night before, so I only had middle seats. And I'm walking along the aisle of the 737. I see these two heavy men on either side, and I'm going, oh man. And they're seeing me, they're like, oh, that, that can't be. And I'm like, yeah, I start shaking my head. And I, before I got in, I said, guys, it's okay, because I've self-identified as an 11-year-old Japanese girl who likes Hello Kitty. So we're going to have a fine flight. So in other words, I mean, I'm taking that, that concept out absurdum. But if you think about what I'm saying, this is the illogic, because you make nothing different by the way that you want to perceive yourself. Nothing's different. But this is what we're getting to. A transition from sovereign nations to international sovereign states. In other words, that you can have, yes, your countries and so forth, and we give you a nod and a wink and so forth, but you need to be part of the bigger thing. You take a look at what's happening right now with the EU and Hungary. And where they're telling Hungary, you know, you got to take your quotient of all of these refugees and migrants that are pouring in. And they're saying, no, Viktor Orban's saying, no, I'm not going to do that. You know why I'm not going to do that? 
because we created a crisis. It's a reflexive moment. We'll get into what reflexivity means in a bit. But when you take a look at what happened with the migrant crisis, it's self-created. Who is it that's transporting all these, quote, refugees into Italy and Greece? Who is it? The NGOs. Well, where are those NGOs from? Open Society Foundations. Eugenics. Eugenics is the science of improving a human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence of desirable, heritable characteristics developed largely by Francis Galton as a method of improving the human race through positive eugenics, selective good breeding of those in society with positive attributes. If that was the case, I wouldn't exist, right? I mean, my gosh, big, heavy, uh, short, uh, Irish guy, you know, in Asia, everybody would look like Kathy Kang, right? Positive eugenics, only the good ones. Negative eugenics, elimination of those in society with undesirable attributes. So now, what are those undesirable attributes? Well, it's what you decide they are. I mean, really, what is the limit? I mean, is it just those that are well, if your IQ is at 101, you know, that's not, that's not cutting it. Because you're not going to be able to contribute, really. You're going to be someone who's going to be middle management for so long. And we're going to have to always tell you what to do. You're never going to be proactive. You're not going to think of things. We only want people that, we want the highest of the high. I mean, I, you can't think of how many Star Trek episodes back in the 60s and 70s dealt with this kind of thing. And dealt with it well. But still, we're going through this. Well, eugenics fell into disfavor only after the perversion of its doctrines by the Nazis. Now, I want you to remember this. Eugenics had its heyday, had its genesis, not in Nazi Germany, but in Great Britain. Take it away, Mr. Shaw. I don't want to punish anybody, but there are an extraordinary number of people whom I want to kill. Not in any unkind or personal spirit, but it must be evident to all of you. You must all know half a dozen people at least who are no use in this world, who are more trouble than they are worth. I think it would be a good thing to uh, make everybody come before a properly appointed board, just as he might come before the income tax commissioners, and say every five years or every seven years, just put him there, and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? If you can't justify your existence, if you're not pulling your weight in the social boat, if you're not producing as much as you consume, or perhaps a little more, then uh, clearly uh, we cannot use the big organization of our society uh, for the purpose of keeping you alive, because your life does not benefit us, and it can't be a very much use to yourself. How many in here was My Fair Lady your favorite movie? <laughs> you see what he's saying? That on his grid of who is worthwhile and who is not, that if you fall underneath his grid or those that are judging in society whose life is worth something, then we need to do away with you. We can't have you be a burden upon society. And I want you to think about in how many ways that has manifested itself today. Not only by abortion mills and human beings only if they're convenient for me in my life at this time, but also now through what's happening, let's just face it, all the way through Europe and the United States in terms of euthanasia. So that's happening. Remember that these ideas were before, and this was before a gentleman by the name of Adolf Hitler actually took. Now, this is the eugenics tree. This was done, of course, by uh, the eugenics conference. The Fabian Society was part of this. Um, George Bernard Shaw spoke at this. 
and it's the eugenics in the self-direction of human evolution. In other words, they would all accept, and as well, uh, Karl Marx's daughter, I believe, was part of, of things with the Fabian Society. I, I, need, I might need correction on that, but she, of course, had, I think, several relationships with several people on the Fabian Society. But it's accepting evolution as a truth and saying, look, this happens over a long period of time. Well, you know what? Let's cut out the whole long period of time stuff of natural selection and all this and the mutations of whatever, you know? Let's cut that out. And if this is true, if the whole idea of evolution is true, let's just get a pure race, the human race. Okay, this is not about race in the way that we look at racism in terms of skin color. Let's start talking about having the most intelligent, the best physically suited human beings on the planet. So we can do away with a lot of the different disabilities and other things and all this having to take care of them, these people that can't take care of themselves. We just need to eliminate all of that. So, eugenics. The concept of eugenics was popularized first in Great Britain and then throughout Europe and beyond. The primary initiative in the, population of, in the popularization of eugenics was to encourage mankind to control and increase the speed of our own evolutionary process by overcoming natural selection by both positive and negative eugenics. Simply stated, the goal of eugenics is to create a pure and exceptional human race. So this is from George Bernard Shaw. We should find ourselves committed to killing a great many people whom we now leave living a part of eugenic politics would finally land us in an extensive use of the lethal chamber. He's talking about gassing. A great many people would have to be put out of existence simply because it wastes other people's time to look after them. George Bernard Shaw, 1910. One of the primary movers of the Fabian Society and the London School of Economics, the founder, co-founder of the London School of Economics. This is from 1933. Well, you may take it from me that the news from Germany is the very best news that we have had since the war. Ever since 1918, we, like all the other powers, have been behaving just as badly as we possibly could. Well, now, when Germany was defeated, when Germany fell, they went and they sat on Germany's head. And they kept sitting on Germany's head. Although it was quite possible, quite evident to any sensible person that they couldn't go on like that forever. Then there came a very intelligent gentleman named Adolf Hitler, and he, knowing perfectly well that the powers would not fight, he snapped his fingers at the Treaty of Versailles. That was what got him a vote of 95% of the whole population of Germany, even including the very people whom he'd been treating rather hardly. Just exactly as if we in England had been in the same position as if the powers had beaten us and sat on our heads. Then the first man who had the gumption to see that we might get up on our legs and defy all those old treaties, he would be the most popular man in England. There can be no peace in the world until there is peace between England, France, Germany, Russia, the United States, and all the big powers of the West. Now, take that home and think about it, and don't be frightened anymore about the Germans. Yeah, don't worry about the Germans. This is in 1933. The Third Reich had just started. This is this brilliant guy by the name of Adolf Hitler. Ah, he's a good guy. This is great news. I need you to think about this for a minute. Think about who was the one that originated the concepts right now that the progressive movement is telling us that we must follow to be caring citizens of the world. The ones that which Open Society Foundations and George Soros are telling us that we need to follow. 
And every single time that, uh, you name it, it doesn't matter if it's Donald Trump. Every time Donald Trump sneezes, they call him Hitler. I'm sorry. Uh, who are the ones that gave you all your progressive ideas? The ones that were actually supporting and giving Hitler some of his ideas. Molding and shaping the world as you would have it be. Fabians reject revolutionary Marxism and instead use and advocate, don't forget this word, gradualism. A step-by-step, -step, long term plan to change the character of the West through incremental change. And let me tell you, that's not just happening in the West. That's happening in the East as well. Unfortunately, I have firsthand knowledge of that, on what's going on. And those that are in China, that are in Taiwan, those that are doing huge business over there, that are involved with Mr. Soros. The general idea is that each man should have power according to his knowledge and capacity. Okay? In other words, we'll determine if you get a seat at the table or not. Because if you're not really where we are, if, you know, we invented 20 words yesterday that you don't even know. And if you're not where we are, we can't have you involved in the decision-making process. And that's where this Donald Trump fella comes along. And he has all these, you know, nationalistic, fervent ideas and so forth. Well, he doesn't know what we know. You need to keep him out. And the keynote is that of my fairy state. From every man according to his capacity to every man according to his needs. A democratic socialism controlled by majority votes. A democratic society controlled by majority votes guided by numbers can never succeed. In other words, what they are pushing now as far as democracy goes in this period of dripping will not last long. A truly aristocratic socialism controlled by duty, guided by wisdom, is the next step upwards in civilization. Annie Besant, a Fabian Society member and later the president of the Indian National Congress. Well, the Fabians at first attempted to permeate the liberal and conservative policy parties with socialist ideas. Now I'm talking about Great Britain. The Liberal Party, and I just was at the Liberal Club in uh, London. That's where we have a lot of our events in London, is where the Gladstone Library, you can see pictures of me speaking there on the internet. And the conservative parties, the Fabians first went to them and were pushed back. Gladstone especially. You know, a liberal said, I don't want any part of this. But later they helped organize the separate Labor Representation Committee, which became the Labor Party in 1906. The Fabian Society has since been affiliated with the Labor Party. So any time that you hear labor, you need to associate it with the Fabians. And any time that you hear the Fabians, you need to associate it with Open Society Foundations and the London School of Economics. It's all part of the same thing. And somehow now you have to start understanding this. And if you take a look at what's happening in, in the UK, the same things, the same rhetoric, the same phraseology is being used there that is being used in the, in the United States. I was in the UK three weeks ago and they had a giant Black Lives Matter rally right there in Trafalgar Square. And you know whose statue they were saying that they need to take down? Nelson. They need to take down Nelson and maybe Churchill too because he said some racist things. No, hey, guys, you have to make sure that you're not just localizing this. This is not just happening in America. So the Fabian Society, after a while, they see the fact that people are saying, oh, look, wolf in sheep's clothing, we don't like this. We gotta change something here. Here I go, it's my turn. It's my turn tonight. Um, the wolf in sheep's clothing thing. So we're going to change our, our logo. And what was changed to is the turtle. And remember, when I strike, I strike hard. Remember that when we're talking about Fabian strategy. 
For the right moment you must wait, as Fabius did, most patiently when warring against Hannibal. Though many censured his delays, but when the time comes, you must strike hard, as Fabius did, or your waiting will be in vain. So understand that the coat of arms of wolf in sheep's clothing represented its preferred methodology, being a wolf in sheep's clothing, for achieving its goal. But the wolf in sheep's clothing symbolism was later abandoned because of its negative connotations. So they still operate in the same way, the same methodology. But now it's a turtle. Why a turtle? Because they're dripping. They're going slowly. They're not trying to rush it. A little bit by attrition, by attrition, by attrition. But when it's time to strike, you strike hard. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the time they are striking hard. Okay? So you need to know what's actually happening. Not just know, but you need to be able to articulate. Okay, so the Fabians decide that they're going to start the London School of Economics and Political Science, which was founded in 1895 by Fabian Society members Sidney Webb, Beatrice Webb, Graham Wallace, and George Bernard Shaw for the betterment of society. The London School of Economics joined the University of London in 1900 and established its first degree courses under the auspices of the university in 1901. And their Latin phraseology for their motto is to know the causes of things. To know the cause. What is it that we have in terms of causality that makes something happen? So if I know the causes of what makes something happen, then if I can manipulate those causes to make something happen, then the mass of people will follow it. In 1946, just after the end of World War II, the London School of Economics hires famed philosopher Karl Popper. Does that name sound familiar to you? Let me also say that the mascot or the crest of the London School of Economics is a beaver. And the reason that, well, for here it is right here. Sorry, now I just blew my mic again. But uh, here it is. That's the crest of the London School of Economics. And think about what do beavers do? They change the courses of rivers, right? The river was going this way all the time. All of a sudden, we split it. Something else has changed. So Karl Popper, famed philosopher, best known for his work in developing the ideas surrounding open societies and the tolerance paradox, OK? The tolerance paradox, read through this with me. Unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. Let me read that again. Unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. If we extend unlimited tolerance to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the, in, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance with them. Mr. Popper, you're intolerant. <laughs> you've decided what should be tolerated and not tolerated. So in other words, you've just decided that you need to be crowned king. In this formulation, I do not imply, for instance, that we should always suppress the utterance of intolerant philosophies. That's, of course, in his mind what he believes is intolerant. As long as we can counter them by rational argument and keep them in check by public opinion, suppression would certainly be most unwise. But... We should claim the right to suppress them, if necessary, even by force. I think you're starting to hear that today, bake my cake. And for it may easily turn out that they are not prepared to meet us on the le level of rational argument, but, by, but begin by denouncing all argument, they may forbid their followers to listen to rational argument because it's deceptive, and teach them to answer arguments by the use of their fists or pistols, Antifa. We should therefore claim, in the name of tolerance, the right not to tolerate the intolerant. Again, Mr. Popper, Dr. Popper, I apologize. Dr. Popper, do you not see that you are the one who's intolerant? And tolerance is simply on your tolerance grid. Who is it that decides what is tolerant and what is not intolerant? We should claim that, that any movement preaching intolerance places itself outside the law. That's here in the United States. That's here in Great Britain. That's all over Europe. You say something against Islam, 
in Europe, you're gone. You blaspheme Christianity, you're praised. And we should consider incitement to intolerance and persecution as criminal in the same way as we should consider incitement to murder or to kidnapping or to the revival of the slave trade as criminal. So whatever Dr. Popper has decided is intolerant. Whatever it may be. If you say, look, I would prefer not to have a grown huge man use the restroom with my wife. You bigot, you intolerant, you whatever. You know, you know I'm sorry, but I, <laughs> you know, I, I really just, I, I don't want you teaching my kids the, all the tenets of Islam. And so, you tolerant, you're intolerant, bigot. I'm sorry, but you don't want me to treat you teaching them Christianity in school. Well, no, because that's white privilege, that's you know, civilization, and that's what has been suppressing people's freedoms. It's all on their grid. So now we get to open societies, which is the big thing for Karl Popper. The open society is a concept originally suggested in 1932 by French philosopher, philosopher Henry Bergson and developed during the Second World War by Austrian-born British philosopher Karl Popper, a closed society... So when you start to listen to people, like, I don't know if you remember that EU meeting, or it was the NATO meeting, where you had Angela Merkel, and as well you had uh, Theresa May, and uh, then as well uh, the French Prime Macron, the French Prime Minister, all get up to give speeches before Trump got up. I counted 11 times that I heard the term open society, and then the term closed society. A closed society is a closed system of law or religion. In other words, you're saying, they, this is what our society is based upon. Judeo-Christian principles. You know, this is what we're based upon. That's a closed society. As such, it is static like a closed mind. Bergson suggests that if all traces of civilization were to disappear, the instincts of the now closed society would remain for including or excluding others from it. In contrast, an open society is dynamic and inclined to the ideal of moral universalism. In other words, no morals, except those that we believe that should be moral. But if you have morals that you're bringing in, no, we can't have those because that's from the old closed society. So anything that was from the previous society is heresy. And anything that is from our new open society is now dogma. Popper saw the open society as standing on a historical continuum, reaching from the organic tribal or closed society through the open society marked by a critical attitude to tradition. You know, we need to, here in the workplace, no more Merry Christmas and so forth. That's not politically correct. You know, just take that out of here. No, no, all the Christmas things. No, they're not Christmas trees, they're holiday trees. And I know everybody has different ideas on that. Everybody, I know somebody's going to come to me and say, Mike, they're Tammuz trees. Okay, I understand. But I'm just talking about, I'm just talking about from our traditions that we have, you know, that have come through a Judeo-Christian background. So we're talking about all the things that we do. No, that must be destroyed. It must be silenced. It must be completely oppressed. But anything that is directly the opposite of that must be be celebrated and shoved down your throat 24 hours a day, nonstop. Anything that before was something that we said, that's not good, we don't want to promote that, is now what is being promoted. To the abstract of depersonalized society lacking all face-to-face -face interaction transactions. So let's go back or closed society, second line, through the open society marked by a critical attitude to tradition up to the abstract, or depersonalized society lacking all face-to-face -face interaction transactions. I almost put in here, there's a new fellow that's a Serbian. I gave it to my team the other day. People are paying, I mean, ridiculous amounts of money to stand in front of this guy, what's his name again? Bachur or something? Braco. What is it? Braco. Braco. And he just simply looks at you for seven minutes. And other people look at him and they start crying and breaking down and so forth. And, and now they're doing live streams. You can pay to have a live stream. And this, they covered all these people in Hawaii who were standing there waiting for, for Braco and so forth. Then all of a sudden the screen opens up and it's a live stream of him looking at you. And everybody just 
for seven minutes is standing there. They start crying. It's like, this was so powerful. Think about it. Face-to-face -face interaction transactions. What do we not have today? I mean, there's times that you can just look in an entire room and people going out to dinner, and this is all you see. Right? What do you lose? Empathy. Why are these people crying from just looking at this Bracco guy? Because he's looking back at them with empathy. Maybe you haven't had that since your mom, you know, 30 years before. Because nobody bothers looking at each other anymore. Talking, feeling. Sorry. In 1947, a young man traveled from Hungary to London. And this young man was actually pressed into service. His father was trying to protect him. They changed his name from a Jewish name to try to protect him. And he was going from house to house and with Nazi collaborators and gathering goods of Jews and so forth. But he was actually Jewish, but this is the way his father tried to protect him. I think in that, that's noble. But this guy, after World War II in 1947, it's, the war's been done now for two years, he traveled from Hungary to London and enrolled in the London School of Economics. His chosen mentor during his times was Dr. Karl Popper. First of all, who founded the London School of Economics? George Bernard Shaw, okay? Now who's his professor? Dr. Karl Popper. Talking about the paradox of tolerance, Open societies. The famed master of philosophical science and developer of the Bergson concepts of open society. What was his name? George Soros. Okay, this is not conspiracy stuff. I mean, I, I love it when all these different websites that are controlled by George Soros or funded by them are saying, oh, this is ridiculous, all oh, this conspiracy stuff, this is just a nice old man, He's Santa Claus, he just wants to help people. No, no. I mean, Look, let's just start talking about things for real. Let's get out of the wolf in sheep's clothing mode and let's start to talk and debate and figure out really what are the better things for society as opposed to throwing all this disin disinformation at us. Let's have real conversations like we used to as Americans. Okay, the first thing I wanna make sure you understand is to understand Mr. Soros' property, we must first understand that, Ms. and this is the same thing with George Bernard Shaw, He's not a playwright first. That Mr. Soros is a philosopher first and an economist entrepreneur second. Okay? The first thing that he is is a philosopher. And I'm telling you, he's brilliant. I mean, I've, I've listened to probably in... Ryan, are you in the room? Is Ryan here? Okay, he's probably in the restroom. But... Uh, Ryan and anybody that rooms with me has to hear George uh, Soros and all of his lectures because see I'm not going to go and do my research um, you know or, I mean no offense but Alex Jones and that's not where I'm getting my research I'm getting my research from George Soros I want to know what he's thinking I want to know what his plans are I want to know what his thoughts are and I want to cut through all this and really find out what we can do about it because if we don't, folks, we're going to lose it very quick. Because it's not just the Democrats. Because the Democrats are no longer Democrats. They're progressives. And a good portion of the Republicans are no longer Republicans. They're not even Democrats. They're not even liberals. They're progressives. But they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Mr. Soros has gone beyond Popper, revising and evolving Popper's views on open society and developing his own philosophical presuppositions. Okay, so he has gone beyond Popper. Mr. Soros developed, I should say, additional considerations on top of the concepts of the tolerance paradox, open society, and fallibility. His greatest contribution to philosophy is through the understanding of reflexivity. Reflexivity. Okay, let's go a little bit deep here. This is important. That's great, that's a great idea instead of taking notes, is taking that picture and you got it forever. So, you know, you can take notes later. Reflexivity refers to circular relationships between cause and effect. Remember, we're talking about causes, right? What was the whole motto, again, of the London School of Economics? To know the causes of things. 
A reflexive relationship is bidirectional. It goes both ways with both the cause and the effect affecting one another in a relationship in which neither can be assigned as causes or effects. Some call it a bandwagon idea in the social sense of reflexivity. In sociology, reflexive, reflexivity therefore comes to mean an act of self-reference where examination or action bends back on, refers to, and affects the, in, the entity instigating the action or examination. Let me put it to you this way. I'm going to make a couple statements. If I was to say, it's raining, and we were in Juneau, that would be something out of a cognitive response. You could say, yes, Mike, it's raining, or no, Mike, it has stopped raining. But we know it to be true. This is a reflexive statement. This is a revolutionary moment. <coughs> now, the reception of that will determine whether that is true or not. And then, if an action is taken back by you going, yes it is, let's, let's go to war against this. And I don't mean by fists and guns and so forth, but let's, let's take this on. If there is an action to the cause, then we have reflexivity. <coughs> reflexivity is also known as the Pygmalion effect. You getting it? Same thing. Same thing. Create something that isn't currently what it is. So if our whole job here is to break it to pieces and to mold it as we would understand it to be in the way we want it, nothing's changed. Mr. Soros would establish the hedge fund management organization Quantum Fund, named after quantum physics, eventually using the principles of reflexivity to manipulate the British pound and breaking the Bank of England. So how do you do this? You start, I mean, it's just like anything, and of course the Bible tells us not to do this. You start a bad rumor. You start negative talk. You start saying things that manipulate actions and reactions of people. And that's how he did it. So with that, you have this whole purpose of trying to make sure that we change everything across society. Not just how we look at each other as human beings, how we do things, how we act, how we educate, how families are, and as well, how our faiths are. So, let me just give you a little bit of an understanding. If you haven't quite caught it yet, here's a quick introduction to reflexivity. George Soros and the Theory of Reflexivity, also known as Self-Fulfilling Prophecies or the Bandwagon Effect. Since the dawn of existence, we have tried to explain our surroundings. Unavoidably, we also react to them. But most of the time, our reactions don't have an impact. This is where financial markets differ. Our reactions actually do have an impact, change the environment, and create a feedback loop of further reactions. This is the theory of reflexivity. It looks like a normal nice day, but Jim, a big investor, decides to start selling because he feels bearish. Maybe he came across a black cat on the way to work. Who knows? Bill and Sarah take notice. When they don't know what's going on, they don't stick around to find out who's the patsy. So they start selling too. More investors notice and more selling follows. The result? Prices keep falling. Consumers lose wealth and confidence. Businesses stop hiring demand evaporates, and suddenly the whole economy is in shambles. Selling in fear of a weak economy impacted the environment and became a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
this is why financial markets are prone to booms and busts that don't have to start with a crisis, but can cause one. In other words, it's the same thing that would happen in economic markets that could happen in social markets as well. Is that you start saying, oh, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. This is what happens like when I have a tour. If I have someone that is with me in a large group who becomes that guy, you know, who starts going to everybody and complaining about something, all of a sudden you can start to have an angry mob, you know, start to, to form. And before you know it, here on a tour that I've got, I've got Occupy Wall Street in the middle of my tour, right? Because someone doesn't like the way his toilet flushes in his hotel room. And so this is the kind of thing that happens in all of our lives, and we can see how it happens in a church, right? Someone has something to pick against whatever the pastor was that just preached something, and he has a bone to pick with him about something. And he starts to go to 20 other people and say, I have a bone to pick with you about this or that or whatever it may be. Well, that's how bad things start, and that's how you fire a pastor. That's how that sort of thing happens. So, reflexivity in social theory is practiced by creating an atmosphere of transmission and then acceptance of either true or false statements in order to fulfill the manipulative function. So again, these things are talked about in a very dry, sciencey fashion, but Manipulation is the key. I would like to manipulate the populace because all they are is mice in Calhoun's experiment. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but we will be familiar with that tomorrow. <coughs> so I just want to manipulate them and have them do what I want them to do. So I start an issue. A manipulative, reflexive moment is dependent on fertile fallacies. Okay, this is very important. Fertile fallacies. So it's a fallacy, in other words, it's not true, but it's fertile. A fertile fallacy is a false statement that is purposed to be received and believed with the purpose of manipulating opinion, moving decisions, and changing conceptual frameworks. Once again, a fertile fallacy is a false statement that is purposed to be received and believed with the purpose of manipulating opinion, moving decisions, and changing conceptual frameworks. How many of those have happened in the last eight years through the entire Obama administration? You know, I mean, what does it matter, right? With Benghazi? And I mean, you have one channel talking about the contractors from Benghazi saying, hey, we were told to stand down. So, a few fertile fallacies. <laughs> Donald Trump colluded with Russia to steal the presidential election. What is the actual truth? Hillary Clinton colluded with George Soros. John Podesta, who was George Soros' number two, was her campaign manager to push down Bernie Sanders. Now, I'm glad that Bernie Sanders is not president, believe me. But to basically push him out of the DNC election. Donald Trump is a racist white supremacist. No, just keep on saying that a million times. Don't mention the fact that he bought Doral, and one of the reasons that he bought Doral is because it used to be owned by Doris and Al that were two Jewish folks that were married that were not allowed to join the other Miami club scenes because they didn't want Jews to be a part of it. So they started Doral. And Doral was now a famous place that would be racially inclusive. It's one of the reasons that it was attractive to them. And not to mention how he stuck up for every race in Palm Beach County. And that's storied. It's why Jesse Jackson had given him awards in the past. Oh, but no, he's a white, racist white supremacist because he said we need to control illegal immigration. Well, why did he want to control illegal immigration? Because what has been happening for the past not just eight years, 16 years, I'm sorry, is that we've had the attempt to create an open society, to make our borders meaningless, to include globalism. How about global warming? And what's the whole purpose of global warming? To make sure that every single country is treated like a nation state because, hey, we're all in this together. And as a matter of fact, you, who have more people and produce more, you need to pay a larger tax and then that money needs to go to the under other countries. So what you're doing is you're just creating a giant welfare state. 
Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Has nothing to do with climate. Gender identification and critical race theory. That's just, I mean, you can't make a dog a cat, can't make a cat a dog. I mean, it is what it is. Your chromosomes are what they are. So what you're telling people is to lie to themselves because you want to identify as something. In other words, you're self-deluding yourself. And it's not that I don't have compassion on people that are having issues. And that's the one thing. We, we can't just be sarcastic, and I'm sorry, sometimes I am. We need to, to talk and work with them with love because they're made in God's image. But we need to remind them that they're made in God's image. And they're perfect in the way that God intended them to be. Okay, our friends Matthew Vadum at uh, Capital Research Center did a wonderful little video. We're going to close with this because we've got a lot to take care of tomorrow, and I've taken up a lot of your time today. I've tried to make it as brief as possible, but I know I've gone long. George Soros is one of the biggest spending political donors in the world. With a net worth of $25 billion, he has funded the most powerful groups on the American left, including arms of the Democratic Party, ACLU, Center for American Progress, and the presidential campaigns of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. So it's worth understanding who he is and what he thinks. Soros made his initial fortune as a hedge fund manager. He is infamous for breaking the Bank of England by shorting the British pound in 1992, leading to the currency's massive devaluation and a crisis in the British economy. Influenced by philosopher Karl Popper and his book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, Soros claims to advance Popper's vision of a society averse to totalitarianism. An open society is one that values individual rights and recognizes that because perfect knowledge is impossible, our social institutions ought to be open to new ideas and change. And so Soros's political and philanthropic operation is called the Open Society Foundations. Later, as Soros's views took a dangerous turn away from Popper, he continued to lay claim to the open society concept. He claims there is a deep-seated conflict between capitalism and open society. He's a proponent of European-style socialism and thinks China has a better functioning government than the United States. Soros takes a concept he calls reflexivity and applies it to capital markets, an idea not taken seriously by most economists. This, he argues, makes it impossible for a market economy to remain stable and justifies government intervention in markets. This turn from Popper has led Soros to fund political groups worldwide determined to destroy free markets. And so the so-called open society Soros claims to want isn't really open at all. Soros funds the Institute for Policy Studies, which has had multiple fellows call openly for violent tactics to destroy the U.S. government. Soros money funded Occupy Wall Street, a movement dominated by anarchist and communist revolutionaries, and whose supporters held up signs saying, Jews control Wall Street. Soros funded Black Lives Matter, which publicly calls for riots and violence against police officers, and United We Dream, an organization that tries to warn illegal aliens in advance of immigration raids. Perhaps Soros' influence is best summed up in his own words. We are trying to make the world a better place, but that's not always what we accomplish. Okay, let's go back with a couple things to review here before we break. First of all, we understand that Fabianism and the Fabian Society brought a lot of these ideas to the forefront. Second of all, we understand that Unfortunately, some of our favorite movies like My Fair Lady, uh, it's actually a, a, a symbol or an analogy to what they're really trying to accomplish. Hey, one little thing about that. Where did he find Eliza Doolittle? Where? Covent Garden. Covent Garden. Where did they build the London School of Economics that I was just at three weeks ago? Covent Garden. Covent Garden. Hmm. Right across from Darwin's shop, I mean not Darwin's, but uh, Dickens' uh, Shop of Curiosities, right there. Something to remember here, folks. Then remember that on this, then Karl Popper was hired. <coughs> Karl Popper and Open Societies. George Soros becomes his student. Then those ideas are used. And then we have ref reflexivity, which becomes the main engine for change throughout our world. Tomorrow, we will have a continued presentation. It's going to get to the details. 
you know the why now, we will then look at the how tomorrow, and as well look at what's happening within, unfortunately, Christian ministries throughout the world that are being influenced by George Soros and Open Society Foundations. Thank you.